Uh, our topic is women and anti-Semitism. This is a reference not to those who have experienced anti-Semitic bigotry. It refers to the, to the experiencing of anti-Semitism as a woman, targeted ironically by other women, and from within a context where it would be least expected, at least on the face of it, namely from within the women's movement itself. This plenary, I've reached the conference conclusion, a conference that has been disturbing on so many levels, and yet I think um, has also been affirming on other levels for many of us. This plenary discusses a form of anti-Semitism that cuts across all of the perspectives we have heard. Its particularity derives from its very universality. If we consider the tremendous impact of feminist ideology on the world in which we live, if we attempt to grasp its incalculable influence on our collective outlook and on virtually every aspect of contemporary human interaction, one can then grasp the potential reach of the values and perspectives it spreads. Our speakers bring very different stories, but share important features. Each has been a fully committed and identified activist within the feminist movement, fighting for its stated aims of equality and self-determination by fighting bias, bigotry, and double standards. Yet each experienced crushing disillusionment when faced with the bias and double standards which remained when it came to the Jewish movement of self-determination. When they found no room for their viewpoints within this, their ideological home, the situation forced a break. In some cases, it was an expulsion manifested in their marginalization and ostracism. In others, it was an abrupt leave-taking with no looking back. And in other cases, in different, different attempts to negotiate the divide. We're truly fortunate to have women of such distinction and prolific accomplishment address us today. We're determined to stick to the time limit allotted to each speaker so that there remains ample time for discussion. I would just say that cumulatively, these stories form an allegory, and as such, they are a gripping cautionary tale. Each speaker will note the corrosive effects of anti-Israel and anti-Zionist, and anti-Israel and anti-Semitic attitudes on the feminist agenda and on the cause of women as well as Jews. Each one of them, in a different field, continues to argue for intellectual and moral honesty with respect to these issues. They will also note the heavy cost which resulted from taking a stand against the distortion of ideals to which they had been so fully committed. With today's accusations of dual loyalty being leveled at Jews and in America and elsewhere from some quarters, we do well to listen to their words and consider their implications. It's a pleasure now to introduce the panel. Um, there is no greater authority to speak to this topic today than our first speaker, Professor Phyllis Chesler, whose courageous and tireless outspokenness has shed light for so many around the world. A very abridged bio, very abridged, reads as follows. Phyllis Chesler is an emerita professor of psychology and women's studies at City University of New York. She is an author, psychotherapist, lecturer, and an expert courtroom witness. She has lectured and organized political, legal, religious, and human rights campaigns in the United States and Canada, Europe, the Middle East, and the Far East. Her work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Hebrew, Polish, and other European languages. Phyllis Chester is the co-founder of the still ongoing Association for Women in Psychology and the National Women's Health Network, and is a charter member of the Women's Forum. She is a founder and board member of the International Committee for Women of the Wall, an affiliated professor with Haifa and Bar Ilan Universities, and is also on the Syrian Committee of the Human Rights Coalition Against Radical Islam. <coughs> in 1979 and 80, she worked at the United Nations and organized a meeting in Oslo. From there, she traveled to the World Conference in Copenhagen, which turned out to be a precursor to both Durban I and Durban II. <coughs> Subsequently, she returned to America and convened a panel for the National Women's Studies Association not far from here. Stores Connecticut, right? Uh, to confront about anti-Semitism in the name of feminism. 
Phyllis Chesler's 13 books and thousands of articles and speeches cover diverse issues. Her books include the classic Women and Madness, a new edition of which was published in 2005. A new edition of another classic, Women's in Humanity to Women, appeared in 2009. And her other books include The New Anti-Semitism, The Current Crisis, and What We Must Do About It, and The Death of Feminism, What's Next in the Struggle for Women's Freedom. She has published two important academic studies about honor killings, which appeared in the Middle East Quarterly in 2009 and in 2010. She has lived in Kabul, Afghanistan, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and now resides in Manhattan. With her current, with her current, with our current events, vindicating her prognoses of decades past, we are privileged that she will share her assessment and forecast with us today. Yes. The volume, whoever can adjust the volume, please come and do so. Now, I may not be able to, good morning, I may not be able to keep standing, so at a certain point, I may relocate and sit down. Um, <coughs> I want to begin with the good news. I was, what is that sound? <laughs> um, what are these sounds going on? <laughs> okay. Can everyone hear me? Echo, echo. Our technological expert from the 22nd century, Ron Asinsky. I want to begin with some good news first. The panel, myself included, remain feminists. We are the feminists. And the value now for all of us gathered here resides in the bridge that I've been making and that others will be able to make with Muslim feminists, Muslim dissidents, ex-Muslim feminists and dissidents who have felt utterly abandoned in their war against gender apartheid under Islam by Western left-oriented feminists. So that most of my work has recently been done with Muslim and ex-Muslim feminists and dissidents and not with all the second wavers who probably are not reading or are reading and fainting over what I'm saying. So what we must do, in fact, is make bridges with them and support them because our governmental leaders are not doing so. Our governmental leaders and our police and judicial forces are rather consulting <coughs> with Islamists who crush the voice of democracy and human rights. So as feminists, I and others on this panel have remained committed to an, a concept of the universality of human rights. We're not culturally relativists, which is <laughs> crucial. So four score and 10 years ago, women won the right to vote in the United States. And 30 years ago, in 1980, as Jennifer pointed out, I stood with the Mishlachet, the delegation in Copenhagen, and we experienced the precursor to Durban 2001. And 29 years ago, not far from me at Stores Network, I convened a panel to present feminism and anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism before the National Women's Studies Association meeting. And to challenge them about their anti-Semitism and their anti-Zionism, which equals racism. And they were committed to anti-racism. And I have been doing this since the early 1970s. But trust me, even I could not have predicted the uh, rapid and extreme Stalinization <coughs> and Palestinianization that would take place among academics and activists in general, including feminists, 
And I could never have imagined that the Western intelligentsia, good people, including the feminists, would make so tragic an alliance with Islamic barbarism and misogyny. I became a feminist leader in 1969, and I remain one. And most of the others who I worked with in that first decade are still back in that historical moment. They're not engaging with history. We on this panel are. So are women racists? Well, we might as well ask, are women human beings? But are women also anti-Semites? Well, to do justice to that question would require another conference. Women have internalized the same prejudices that men have. And like men, women are also racists and sexists. And women are also consummate bystanders at the crossroads where evil meets its prey. And the majority feminist view that women are weak or innocent, non-actors, powerless to affect the destiny of nations, is a fantasy that bears no relationship to reality. And it took me 20 <coughs> years to write Woman's and Humanity, Woman, which pointed this out. Without this awareness, feminists would never understand the high school clique, shunning, ostracizing, bad girl, mean girl behavior that went on within political movements with much at stake. So women are, are consummate collaborators. And we try to choose, most of us, powerful men as protectors. And we don't ask them, oh dear, what did you do today in your work at the concentration camp? So women profit by collaboration and do not confront evil. They are among those who are bystanders at best and opportunists at worst. Are educated women and human rights activists and lesbian feminists and Jewish Lesbian feminists also anti-Semites? Oh, hell yes. Because neither education, nor talent, nor ambition, nor privilege, nor vulnerability, or pariah status, or a sense of grievance seems to be able to inoculate people against the virulent virus of anti-Semitism. So thus, I have lived to see the day, we all have when most, not all of whom are women, the feminists seem to care more about the alleged occupation of a country which does not exist and never has existed, called Palestine, than they care about the real Islamist occupation of Palestinian women in that place. American and European feminists, like everyone else in the academy, are post-colonial, post-modern, anti-interventionists. They are cultural relativists, and they're culturally sensitive. They believe in diversity. They no longer believe in men and women's universal human rights, and they will not take a stand against apartheid, at least not as it's practiced by Muslims. Instead, feminists like non-feminists, activists, academics, scapegoat Israel as the apartheid state and refuse to understand that Islam is the largest practitioner of gender and religious apartheid in the world. And when I said this at Barnard in 2003, right after my book, The New Anti-Semitism, came out, um, I caused the near riot and I had to be hustled out to my safety and I thought, ah, the brown shirts are back. And indeed I was right. And it, if there's time in the discussion period, perhaps we'll talk about the silencing and the demonizing of professors on the American campus who try to speak the truth about Israel. I'm not saying tell lies to defeat the big lies. Just tell the truth. Now, anti-racism, not anti-sexism, is the feminist priority, except where Israel is concerned. Zionism equals racism in the academy, and they don't understand that precisely the opposite is true. It's anti-Zionism that equals racism. Judea Pearl made this point very poignantly in his writing after his son's beheading. And that this is indeed what part of the new anti-Semitism is about. This is one of the things I wrote in my book. 
that and its Islamified version. So for the last decade, we have all seen people in the street who call themselves feminists, Jewish, non-Jewish, men, women, they march for Palestine, they wear kafiyas, they march against Israel, the Nazi apartheid state, they sign petitions to divest and boycott in Israel, and this includes gay and lesbian feminists who would be tortured and persecuted if not executed, and to whom Israel alone gives asylum if they're coming from the disputed territory. And these very signers and marchers uh, who carry on about the Turkish assassination flotilla do not take anywhere near a strong stand against the stoning of women in Muslim countries or against the forced face veiling of women, ditto in Muslim countries, or against the acid attacks against little girls in Pakistan and in the border areas between Pakistan and Afghanistan. They don't even really take a stand these days. Uh, it, some believe that the burqa is an ultimate feminist choice. I have a new article coming out on whether America should consider banning the burqa in Middle East quarterly in the, in the winter. Most feminists aren't really, yes, for a while we took a stand against female genital mutilation, which is really an African custom with some Muslim participation in Egypt and Somalia, if they're in, if they're in Africa. But we're not that comfortable coming out against polygamy, amazing, or uh, first cousin marriage or forced child marriage or honor-related violence, because if you single out the battering of immigrant women who happen to be Muslim in the West, it means you're a racist and you can't say it. And men batter women everywhere, we can't single them out. It's, it, it would be racist to do so, even if it means that their blood then is on our hands because we're not finding ways to reach out to save them. We don't really stand against honor killings. The mainstream media will only report an honor killing if it's committed by Hindus and in India. They will not report on honor killings committed by Muslims in America, or in Canada is better in this regard. America is so far hopeless because they're afraid they'll either be bombed or sued, or worse, seen as politically incorrect. So like, St like Stalinists, the Feminist Academy, has, when I say the Feminist Academy, I mean the Academy. Feminists are part of it. They're not separate, they're not worse than, alas, they're not too different than the rest of the Academy. They saved their fire to protest Guantanamo. Remember that? And Abu Ghraib, and former President George Bush, and American and Israeli military occupation of Muslim lands. This drew the dragon breath fire. If you challenge this, there would be stone-facedness, accusations of racism, accusations that you are doing McCarthyism on them, and then slandering and shunning, and then disinvitations, non-invitations. Um, I have a long history battling this within feminist and left movements. There may not be enough time. How long have I been speaking? Six minutes. I have six minutes, okay. Yes, I learned a great deal working at the United Nations. Don't go there. Why we pay <coughs> taxes, why the place is standing is beyond me. That's another discussion. And I mean, but it should fall merely by the weight of its moral hypocrisy and by its ineffectiveness. And all things save one, the legalizing of Jew hatred. There it is really effective. Stopping genocide in Rwanda, not happening. In the summer of 2000, I learned that my Israeli feminist left friend and colleague, Marilyn Safir of Haifa University, had been invited and then was disinvited to a feminist conference in Turkey. Why? Guess what? It was decided that perhaps the Arab and Muslim women attending might not be comfortable discussing matters of, se of a sexual nature 
with a Jew presence. Now, you can't accuse them of being racist because they don't see anti-Semitism as racism. They see the Jews as racist, not the Jews. Orwell would not believe this or not. So Marilyn called me, both Francis Rigai and I, and a number of other people wrote letters protesting. What is this? Well, the conference was canceled rather than by one year. Or it may have been held secretly. It may have been held secretly. And the feminists in Israel, the Israeli left feminists, said, you know, Phyllis, we can understand their point of view that you're so good at doing this. We can really, you know, maybe they're not comfortable. Maybe our presence would stifle them or get them in trouble afterwards. Blah, blah. In the last 20 to 30 years, major feminists have misapplied hard-won feminist knowledge in the service of demonizing Israel. For example, we have my old friend, Andrea Dworkin. She should rest in peace. Uh, I took it to Israel for the first time, and then in uh, a novel the year afterwards, Mercy, she, uh, and it's a great novel, she compared the Jewish God to a Nazi without mercy. Okay, it's a novel. But then in 2002, she writes a work of nonfiction called Scapegoat, the Jews, Israel, and Women's Liberation, and she compared the Jewish state to a pimp and a John, guess who's the prostitute of women? Palestinians. But you know, Ruhama Martin, an Israeli feminist psychiatrist, did one better at a conference at Newport's. What did she do? She likened Israel to, the, to a batterer. And the, who's the battered wife? Of course, the Palestinians. So I, I, I wonder, are the Israelis and Palestinians married? Or is the feminist view of marriage that it is like the Israeli-Palestinian relationship? <laughs> Maybe it's the same. So, and the academic literature, the post-colonial feminist literature, is rife and rank with example after example in which Israel is blamed for the beating of women because of the occupation of women being beaten in love. This was 2010 in The Lancet. And I published a letter there opposing this study with a lead Harvard female author. And there are some Muslim feminists who are pro-Israel who are not able to speak without serious security. Myself also have now ascended to that level. The signatories, the signatories, Robin Morgan and Jane Fonda and Eve Ensler and Angela Davis, they keep signing this, these petitions. The most, I'm going to skip, there's a bunch of examples of the <coughs> time. Um, let me, ask me afterwards why I was disinvited by Cambridge to keynote their 10th anniversary of women's studies. That was an interesting education. And um, now I want to move to some feminists have begun to resist and to protest in the KPFA station in California, for example, has a radio program called the Feminist Magazine. And they finally invited me to speak on these subjects. And they nearly lost their program. And the switchboard lit up, and people were protesting. And feminists, mainly Jewish lesbian feminists, were going to take it over because this was slander and racism. It wasn't bottled left wing sound of one left hand <coughs> clapping. So, what do we have? We have American and European Western left feminist and gay movements who have made a marriage in hell with Islamist. Terrorism. The very same left that has never expressed the slightest guilt over Stalin and their cover up for Stalin's murder of, not now Stalin, a hundred million people because they weren't perfect enough for a perfect new society. <coughs> they are the ones who are describing Zionism as racist and Israel as an apartheid Nazi state. And these Westerners share an extraordinary psychological rage which requires a scapegoat and a cleansing messianic promise 
If we can't be perfect, if we can't perfect society, we're going to kill you in order to do so. If you're standing in a way, we're going to kill you so that we can do what, because there is no God, there's only us, there's only humanity, you can make it all happen. And there's also an inability to be introspective, to look within, an overwhelming need for group approval, uh, an inability to really think independently, a dreadful conformism, and then a very adolescent, in-your-face rebelliousness towards certain authorities only, coupled with an adolescent slavish adoration of other authorities, fascists, boot and face, <laughs> suicide bomber authorities, a desire for cathartic violence, the ecstasy of mob action, and the most uncanny and frightening ability to scapegoat Jews precisely because leftists, idealists, perfectionists, good people have not been able to achieve the desired new world of order. And if some ideal cannot be achieved, then the Jews must pay. Many examples, not enough time. Academics and activists, some are merely opportunists. And anti-Zionism is trendy. It gets you funding, it gets you tenure, you keep your friendship networks. Um, and that's how it goes. Plus, you're also taught, you're indoctrinated to think that you really believe this is the truth. And some, as I said, are incapable of original thinking, so they follow the herd. And they, the good people want to abolish world suffering. They think they can do so by abolishing Israel, chas v'chaliba. And some are nostalgic for the 1960s, and they're so furious at America for whatever reason, that they want the barbarians to bring down Wall Street in a way that they themselves never could. One minute. Uh, I have a few things to say about Jews and why Jews would be often at the forefront of the first to critique Israel. And um, clearly they're not thinking what their lives would really be like were the caliphate <laughs> to descend with all of its dark. I mean, I lived in Kabul, Afghanistan. I know what Islam is about. I know what it's like. Americans don't get it, intellectuals don't get it, and in my opinion, the Israel bashers, <coughs> those who deny that anti-Semitism is a blood tide that is rising, they are more afraid than we are of what might be to come of that bloody beast slouching on its way to Bethlehem. Thank you very much. Gloria Greenfield, whose name appears on the program, is able to be here today. Um, our next speaker is Ty Siegel. In the late 1960s, researcher and activist Ty S. Siegel initiated women's studies courses at the University of California in Berkeley. She was included in the Encyclopedia Feminists Who Changed America in 2006. In 1970, Time Siegel became part of a matriarchal village composed of women only, an attempt at female utopia, providing an identity in a community suffused with a sense of female bonding and accomplishment. She has taught a variety of courses at the University of San Francisco, at Cabrillo College, California, SUNY News Halls, and the School of Visual Arts in New York City. She's lectured and published articles on Jewish secular identity and anti-Semitism in progressive movements. Her published fiction appears in several anthologies of Jewish women writers. She comes to us from Berkeley, California. And her topic is, Sisterhood was powerful and global, where did it go? Hello, everybody. Um, I've tossed like a dreamer through my life in America. 
daughter of Yiddish speakers, daughter of the backwoods of New Jersey, I was sleepwalking, incubating, even though 20 years ago, I researched and taught Jewish women's history and published an article called Anti-Jewish Oppression in Progressive Movements. I, I did not feel it. I didn't feel personally threatened. Am I too close? I did not have a sense of personal threat. Except when I thought about Israel. I was afraid to go. Israel was too precious and too vulnerable. Finally, Pesach week, 09, I went to Israel. Enchanted, I wrote a story of my adventure called Three Weeks in the Holy Land. It's the best story I've ever written. <clears throat> I loved my little Jewish nation, a whole country of my extended family. But when I arrived back in Northern California, old friends of the decades, people who were always warm and supportive of me and my writing, did not approve of my joy. They did not want to hear that I loved Israel, and they did not want to read my adventure. I went to dinner at the home of an old high school friend, a well-published Talmudic scholar also considered a feminist for his writings. Even though he owes his career to Israel, he felt Israel had no right to defend itself against rockets from Hamas. His response to my questioning this was, for a few rockets? It's lies, it's all lies. I said there were many, many reports of thousands of rockets. It's lies, it's all lies, he said. But I said, but I know someone whose relatives have a half a second to get into a bomb shelter in Eshkelon. He shrugged contemptuously. He, he scoffs at the notion of contemporary anti-Semitism. He poo-pooed the problem of Jews having to flee Europe again. Highly overblown, he says. He compared the Israelis to Nazis in public at a, a ASUC a Associated Students of the University of California, Berkeley, meeting, debating a divestment issue, BDS, we call it, not bondage and discipline. <laughs> he called Israel's effective airline security procedures racism. When I pointed out that these security procedures might save his life someday, he said, I don't care. <laughs> this is what I heard someone call Jewicide. The embedded agenda <coughs> trumps the facts. Yet he has been able to indoctrinate several generations of students now. In academia, there are a lot more like him, Jews and non-Jews. I feel threatened by this kind of thinking. I feel personally threatened. It has stirred up my survival instincts. The Hamas Charter calls for the annihilation of the Jewish people and has done so all along. However, it did not impact me personally. It did not uh, touch my fear level. But now I am more motivated than I ever have been in my life. I am now motivated to speak out and I am impelled by a sense of insecurity not only for Israel, but for America. After returning from Israel, I researched global jihad and the predicament Israel is really in. I have undergone a transformation. I have woken up my survival instincts. And I've woken up my appreciation, too. I appreciate the life I've, I have led in America because I have had a chance to have a life of such incredible freedom. As a woman, I have been able to explore anywhere I wanted to. I, I've been able to uh, create be, and be part of the most exploratory, creative, innovative, novel experiments in, in living and thinking. I've had freedom of choice. I never thought I would do this, but I stand on the street now with a pro-Israel group 
holding an Israeli and or an American flag to counter those demonstrating that anti-Zionism really is anti-Semitism, in case there was any doubt. The flotillistas shout ugly slogans at us. Go back to Auschwitz. And I've had intifada, intifada shouted right in my face, chanted by hundreds of demonstrators held back only by the goodwill of the police. Um, this can really stimulate your survival instincts. In fact, I recommend this greatly. Um, if you want to really wake up your whole being and not just um, have an intellectual experience. Um, you can hear the shouts of from the river to the sea, meaning they don't want a two-state solution, they want it all. Here, K-bar, K-bar, a reference to, a favorable reference to <laughs> Mohammed's seventh century massacre of the tribe of Jews. The Hamasniks shout, smash the Jewish state, target all Jewish businesses, Every Zionist is a target. Bloodthirsty, monster, shame, shame, shame. Well, I'm not ashamed. The local flotilla leader, who lives right near us in El Cerrito, north of Berkeley, um, he's not worried about being indicted by the federal attorney for um, aiding a terrorist organization. He quite openly and flagrantly is soliciting funds for the next flotillas. And this doesn't seem to bother any, anyone I know either. The Jewish, non-Jewish, women, men. <clears throat> Hardcore pacifists are ready to overlook all facts on the ground. They do not want to believe that no matter what they say or do, they have deadly and determined enemies. Patiently, I explain why the Israelis got themselves in a position of needing to have a blockade. But there is no memory, even of the most recent history. I live in Berkeley, California, where I pioneered women's studies in 1970, enabled by a faculty advisor who, 40 years later, now signs petitions to boycott Israel. The topic of Jew hatred of Israel and Jewish history did not arise for me until I researched and taught Jewish women's history in the early 1990s. I was part of a generational bubble. We could have these great lives of intercultural crossover, lives which explored our freedom. In the 1970s, I lived in a matriarchal village. Well, that's what I called it. I wrote a story called Matriarchal Village. Um, no one else really called it that, actually. Just <laughs> it was in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I was a wild women, woman of the Pacific Northwest. And, um, let's see, we were against patriarchy, all patriarchies. By the 1980s, it seemed to me, we had ceded our global vision to the larger left, no longer concerned with the fate of women in Islam. I started hearing condemnations of Israel with no mention of toxic patriarchy surrounding it. The original ideals of global sisterhood seemed to disintegrate into a shocking new rhetoric of blaming Israel. Of course, we were against war, all war. In the 1980s, our slogans merged with the larger anti-war left. Another world is possible. And the larger new age spirituality movement. Be the change you want to see. We refuse to be enemies. There are no enemies anywhere. In Berkeley, there is no free speech if you speak outside the dominant paradigm. Noni Darwish, an ex-Muslim who was an Egyptian-American, she wrote, now they call me infidel, and she wrote an ex expose of Sharia law called Cruel and Usual Punishment, which I recommend greatly because it really um, helped my overall um, con mental concept. Um, came to speak at UC Berkeley campus. She was interrupted so intensely at her campus speech in Wheeler Hall that she had to leave the stage, speech unfinished, with inadequate security. Public education is not easy. Darwish has to live with a bodyguard and death threats. The women's movement in this country has drifted off the rails, not finding Israel perfect 
and not finding our own American relatives perfect, some women in the movement started down a long, slippery slope that they thought, but they thought they were climbing the high moral ground, shouting hypocrites, murderers, at their own relatives and ancestors while claiming a universal identity. The blame Israel always for everything obsession picked up speed. The Israeli government always held in contempt as dominated by right-wing militarists instead of being perceived as led by duly elected leaders who were chosen as the best to maintain security. An old friend from our matriarchal village, we were in a women's writing group together for years, said to me recently, Israel has the most right-wing militarist government in its history. She always made huge, confident claims in a quiet, calm manner. I believed in her confidence, my friend of 35 years. I always craved her approval. And then suddenly, I heard how ignorant and arrogant she sounded. I asked her, how would you feel if you and your extended family were targeted for mass extermination by the ideology of millions of people? She replied, First, I would have to ask myself if it was true. We could try to figure out how to know better what, what is, the truth is. What form does that target for death take? Tell me why you feel your life is in danger of death from those you know and are in physical proximity to. I've, I've never been able to answer her. This is where our friendship has stopped. <laughs> um, she said, maybe this seems like a stupid question. I'm asking it because we have to find solid ground to stand on before we get to the more difficult questions. <laughs> so tell me if you feel this. She is a person I've shared my feelings with for 35 years, but I shut down. She refuses to read the sources that have convinced me of the nature of the anti-Semitism we are facing. Her continued obtuseness indicates to me she's an adherent who refuses to give credence to any development that does not fit the narrative to which she is committed. Okay, next case. A well-known visionary author and earth activist and Wicca leader in the Bay Area, nationally, goes on English language tours of Gaza. After I returned from Israel, I had questions for her, a Jewish witch tourist in Gaza. <laughs> By email, I asked her if she could monitor Al Jazeera in Arabic. I asked if she would ask some questions suggested by Tawfiq Hamid, an ex-Muslim, to define radical political Islam. He asks Muslims and Muslim institutions to clearly, unambiguously, and publicly denounce fighting and killing Jews, calling Jews pigs and monkeys, killing apostates, beating and stoning women for any reason, and gay killing. Her response was to say that radical Judaism needed to denounce these concepts also. Then she rattled off a list of horrendous things that Israeli soldiers and settlers have allegedly done to Palestinians. She signed it, time, your radical consciousness and lifelong commitment to justice is better than this. Love. She signed it, love. As she shifted the blame, as she changed the subject and shifted the blame back to the Jews. A couple of weeks later, she sent me a forwarded message introduced by saying, this is a far more eloquent response to your questions than anything I could write, and then in caps, worth your time to read. But it was not a reference to my questions, but a total blaming of Muslim women's predicament on, uh, what? on Israel and Western imperialism, of course. Nothing about the inculcated Jew hatred. I responded by asking her again if she could monitor Al Jazeera in Arabic, but it was useless because she had blocked my email, and I was totally shocked because no more dialogue was possible, and no one had ever blocked my email before. There are familiar patterns, blaming everything on U.S. imperialism, colonialism, blaming Israel and Jews right back into that familiar groove. Ah, yes, and blaming everything on patriarchy, all patriarchies, not differentiating. A goddess priestess, oh, this is case number three. A goddess priestess 
who produces a very well distributed, very successful women's astrological calendar, mentored me in the 1970s. She is the voice of the old anti-patriarchal spirit. When I tried to tell her, I tried to update her, tell her what's happening in the world today, she wrote about the alternative non-patriarchal world we are creating without men who are so much more stuck in the old adversarial ways of patriarchy. I noticed the we, we of it, the world we are creating, because, of course, we do create our own reality, right? But then she updates herself and writes that getting beyond duality is the only game she wants to play. We all need to grow up and take responsibility for our lives. We need to fight the enemy within as a necessary precondition to fighting what appears to be enemies out there. This is a time of human evolution that will either do us in or force us to change in fundamental ways. She is envisioning the shift that the bumper stickers uh, proclaim, the, the shift that happens. Um, I imagine I imagine the shift also. I imagine that our survival instinct gets stimulated. It wakes up. That we come to appreciate our deepest, most important values and are inspired to defend them. The shift will entail, the motivation will entail feeling personally threatened, as far as I can tell. Now I am a, a Zionist street warrior. I stand with, stand with us. Every week, we stand across the street in Oakland. Uh, we stand across the street from women in black holding Israeli and American flags. Standing next to me on the street was a lesbian who had also been in the Jewish feminist movement. We knew the same names, the local and national celebrities of our literary subculture of the 1970s. We had read the same authors, gone to the same concerts. We came from old lefty families. We know the righteous proclaimers who sign all the local anti-Israel BDS petitions. We are Jews and we support divesting, da da, this kind of thing. But what do they know about Jewish history? The patterns, the repeating patterns. When a petition finally appeared with a long list of those opposed to the hate and lies of the Jewish state, I did not know any of those people, but I had to find them. I had to meet them. I really needed them. I will meet with anyone who supports the Jewish state of Israel. I am not afraid anymore of this surreal situation of being called horrors, being called right wing, even though it is a total obfuscation of the term. Right wing, racist, Islamophobic are words being used to frighten and suppress people with legitimate concerns. I am not drinking the Kool-Aid. I say, hello Berkeley, your acid sparkled streets, heartland in the production of rhetoric, heartland of resistance. I'm here. I love Israel. I love America. Get used to it. <laughs> Jewish Congress, and this spring 
started a group of progressive pro-Israel Jews whose goal is to infiltrate and influence the anti-Israel left in Canada. She will speak about fighting anti-Semitism in the feminist community. Thank you very much to all of you for being here, and to Jennifer for inviting me, and to Yisa for this wonderful conference. <coughs> Today I'll be talking about how to fight back within the feminist community. From my co-presenters on this panel, we've already heard some sobering descriptions and analyses of how anti-Semitism manifests itself there. And like my Jewish feminist sisters, I've been deeply disappointed and disheartened by this phenomenon. However, I have found ways to remain within the feminist movement and from there to fight the anti-Semitism from within, and sometimes even to good effect. So this morning I'm going to share with you some of the strategies that I've used. Of course, what I describe here is not an exhaustive list, and many of you may be doing similar things, but I think that by reviewing some of our best practices and things that have worked, we can begin to articulate strategies that may effectively help to address anti-Semitism around the world. Before discussing the specific strategies I used, I have a few general comments. Um, as we all know, over the past 20 years since I started doing this work, there's been a sea change in the nature of anti-Semitism. And at present, the delegitimization of Israel is so widespread on the left that it's virtually warranted. There are therefore some implications for this to how we approach fighting anti-Semitism now. The first implication is that while acknowledging the excellent efforts of Jewish communities around the world in the fight against anti-Semitism, we need to be doing things that are new and different. As Ruth Weiss pointed out two days ago, we now need interventions that are more innovative, creative, and smart. Because, in my words, our enemies are innovative, creative, and smart, unfortunately. And because fighting a norm is different from fighting a group of neo-Nazi skinheads. For example, you can't arrest a norm. The second premise is that in this kind of activism, in order to be effective, you must be an insider to the group whose norms you are trying to change. Again, this is different from traditional fighting of anti-Semitism. You didn't need to belong to the Aryan Brotherhood to fight them, thank God. But here you need to share the language and the unique subculture, including the particular signs, symbols, and at least some of the norms of the group to have any effect. If all of my years of working to fight anti-Semitism have taught me one thing, it is this, that the only people who can influence the anti-Israel left are the pro-Israel left. Because despite the differences on the issue of Israel, they have a common language. Similarly, within the feminist community, the only people who can affect anti-Israel feminists are pro-Israel feminists. In other words, women who strongly identify as feminists, like Phyllis, Tom, me, and many others, and Jennifer, of course, and at the same time also love Israel and Jewish people passionately enough to go to the mat for them. It's like with the family. It doesn't matter how nice or smart you are. If you're from outside the family, no one's going to let you come inside and change something. So in this kind of work, one must work from the field. Third, the third and last premise underlying this sort of activism is that given how large and potentially daunting the problem of anti-Semitism is, one should only be targeting for change those whom it is possible to influence. It's a waste of our limited time and energy to target hardcore anti-Semites. We should be directing our energy solely towards what I think of as the well-meaning of ignorant, which is how I view many non-Jews, and many Jews as well and many of my feminist colleagues. They're not particularly bad people, necessarily. They're even quite idealistic. It was interesting to hear Dina Porat's analysis of the idealism of some of these people. They've just never really thought about anti-Semitism much before. And no one has challenged them to in a certain way. I heard an interesting talk by the, someone from the Israel Project, and the research showed that when non-Jews are talked to about Israel and anti-Semitism, a significant number of them change. However, the research showed that not enough Jews are actually talking to non Jews, so we must. So the people I target in my efforts are those who are open to influence and whose minds can be changed. Now on to the strategies themselves. And of course, much of what I say can be generalized more broadly to the left. 
Uh, what I say may be a bit more hopeful in tone than some of the other papers uh, of this conference, which understandably have been very sad and disturbing, because I'm going to focus on some successes. There have also, of course, been failures, but there have been many successes, and some of these, I think, will be more instructive for us today than anything else. In approaching my particular corner of the shadow of anti-Semitism, i.e. in the feminist community, I've divided my target group into the feminists inside the academe and those outside of it. This is not a perfect distinction because virtually all feminist scholars, in other words, those working in women's studies programs or in association with women's studies programs, virtually all perceive themselves as part of the larger feminist movement. However, this distinction is still useful because this academic subgroup is amenable to certain influences, one particular strategy that is not useful with those outside of it. So to begin with the feminist academics, activism with this group, the one very powerful tool that one has, I would even say weapon, is research. Specifically, my two most recent studies, both of them feminist in the conceptual framework and approach, and also um, funded by SHRC, which lent them some credibility. One was a national study of Canadian Jewish women and their experiences of anti-Semitism and sexism, and the other was a Toronto study of how Jewish girls, aged 10 to 14, experience and understand anti-Semitism. The context in which I conducted both these studies was the Center for Women's Studies at OICUT, the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. OIS itself is reputed to be one of the worst places in Canada for anti-Semitism. It is a left-wing organization. Um, and this isn't just impressionistic. A few years ago, I conducted a research study on 80 Canadian professors, Jewish professors from four different universities, and OIS showed up as one of the most challenging places, as are many of the women's studies programs in Canada and internationally. However, the Center for Women's Studies, where I am located, is a particularly good place. I feel very fortunate and I feel quite comfortable there. Part of this has to do with its founder and longtime director, who is a non Jewish Judeophile and who would never tolerate any anti Semitism or racism at her center. Now, the two studies, um, I'll tell you briefly about the two studies and how they were used to help influence my feminist cause. The genesis of the study on, national, on Canadian Jewish women was an encounter I had one day with a colleague of mine in the hallway who was organizing the panel for women and diversity in honor of International Women's Day. And I asked her was she going, if she was going to do anything on Jewish women. And she said, well, no, Jewish women can't understand oppression because we're white. Blah, 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 we all know this stuff. So I told her she was wrong. And I asked her if I could come speak to her class, and she said, no, her classes were all booked up. And I said, can I give you something to read? And she said, I don't have time to read. This is a full-time period academic. So I went to find research to give her, and I couldn't find any research that was exactly what I wanted, so I conducted it myself. I was looking for research that would explicitly create the parallel between what's known in feminist circles as the dual oppression or multiple oppression of women, the dual oppression being racism plus sexism, let's say women of color experience. And I wanted to do something on the dual oppression of Jewish women, which is anti-Semitism plus sexism, and therefore, thereby create bridges with my feminist sisters and show the parallels. Uh, I'm a Jewish feminist, I'm a Jewish feminist scholar. This made perfect sense to me. Uh, the study, which I won't discuss in any detail, included 365 women, a random sample from across Canada, and the results showed clearly and undeniably the ugly nature of anti-Semitism, the wide extent of anti-Semitism that Canadian Jewish women encounter in their everyday lives. It also documented the sexism, of course. But the anti-Semitism was the shock for me, and it was by far the more serious of the findings. It also showed the different mental health implications of the two kinds of oppression. The women in the study who said they had many anti-Semitic experiences in their lives also scored significantly higher than the rest of the group on the Beth Depression Inventory. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about the study, it's on my website, moragold.com. There was no such result, by the way, between sexism, uh, correlation between sexism and depressions, which is very important. Uh, another finding from, the from this research was that when they were asked where they had their anti-Semitic experiences, 
the most, second most common place was at school. So I began to wonder about the experience of Canadian Jewish girls growing up now. And to make a long story short, it led to the study of Toronto Jewish girls growing up and their experiences. Uh, like the study on Jewish women, I found disturbing and unequivocal, unequivocal evidence of the reality of anti-Semitism and its disturbing psychological and emotional sequelae in these children. You can get a short, a little flavor for that. I made a film about the Jewish girl study also on my website called Jewish Girl Power. Uh, the Jewish Women's Study was the first national study anywhere on women's experiences of anti-Semitism and the first to find with any population um, a statistically significant relationship with depression. And the Jewish Girl Study was the first of its kind also. But the most important thing for me about these two pieces of research was the opportunity that they gave me to lay out before my feminist colleagues in an irrefutable way the reality of anti-Semitism. I've presented many, many times on both of these pieces of research. And although occasionally I've met with stupid or hostile responses like, you mean there are some good Jews? I mean the Israelis? I mean there are some decent good Jewish women? I don't get it. I, from actually a professor of women's studies in Canada, um, generally speaking, the response has been extremely positive, which I found heartening and surprising. I expected to be attacked for this work, discredited for this work. Some of the things that Phyllis and Time have been through were not the response to the research. Consistent with this, um, when I tried to publish this research and I had expected to find resistance, it was something of a chef actually, of the international feminist community. I sent it to Women's Studies International Forum, which is a very prominent and important Jewish feminist journal. Not only was it accepted, but the non-Jewish editor wrote me a personal note saying this is so important and so eye-opening for me. I'm skipping the queue. You were supposed to go in two years from now. You're going in now. And she did that. So all, the, all of these very positive experiences, which I admit were surprisingly positive, um, have made it possible to maintain some faith, at least, in some of my feminist sisters. Uh, the research, obviously, has been my main weapon when dealing with feminists in the academe. It also was very helpful in a very high-profile debate in which I engaged against one of the most vicious and vociferous anti-feminist, anti-Israel feminist scholars in Canada. Exemplified the perfect illustration of the ignorant but well-meaning people who are capable of being influenced that I alluded to earlier. I know, of course, there are many counter stories where it didn't go well, but I'm telling you that it can go well, and it has gone well sometimes. Um, in terms of feminists outside of the academe, obviously when trying to influence people, different strategies are required. Um, I use the arts, and I use activism. Uh, you've heard a little bit about my, this journal that I've begun, partly because Israeli writers are being boycotted, and I wanted a place for them to show their work. My journal is uh, the story of an Israeli student who is the victim of anti-Semitism at the university, which is <coughs> in Canada for a year. Um, I may become the scholar in residence, the writer in residence at the center where at Boise, and in all of these places I can use writing and arts to reach across. Jewish and non-Jewish feminist bridges. Um, I want to say also that I've discovered, after I began to do all this work using the power, really, of literature and the arts, that uh, many Jewish communities and the Israeli government are beginning to understand that one of the best ways to refute stereotypes about Israel and to fight anti-Semitism is through the use of culture and the arts, which reach beyond the intellect and into the hearts of many and create very intimate and concrete bridges for people. So it's good I'm doing that. And the other one, since the feminists whom I know best uh, from, the, from outside of the academe are primarily artists and activists. I'm using the activism we heard about the group that I'm beginning with others in Toronto. Uh, we have feminists, we have human rights, former human rights commission people. Um, planted throughout the left so that we can infiltrate in different areas. Um, part of the reason people are often ask me how I can do this work because it's so difficult. And part of the reason I can do it is because I feel the support of my feminist, Jewish feminist sisters. And also because I'm not naive. I don't assume that sisterhood, even at the best of times, and we are not in the best of times, will be simple. 
I don't think family relations are ever simple. Uh, in this month's issue of Karen, I, recent, I have an essay entitled Re Re sorry, Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah, A Jewish Model of Sisterhood, in which I demonstrate that the common misperception of these two women as being above all competitors over a man um, is not accurate. And actually, my research had covered the immensely profound and passionate love between these sisters, which according to a Midrash on Lamentations, it was because of Rachel's profound and passionate love for her sister that God delivered us in Israel from exile. For this reason, among others, I believe profoundly in the capacity of some women at least to listen to each other, care for each other, and change. One last comment. One persistent, even insistent question that I think implicitly haunts this conference and every other conference I've ever been to on anti-Semitism is why the mainstream Jewish community internationally, which has been so successful in many respects at fighting anti-Semitism on the right, has until now had relatively limited effectiveness with dealing with it on the left. I think this is related to the fact that for the most part, the Jewish community has not tended to embrace the left. It does not love the left. And it has not included on its team people from the left. In our current situation, this is now a major liability. Particularly since, as I've said, the cleaning up of the left can only come from within. However, even for those of you who are not feminists or on the left, you have a crucial role to play in this. You can search out and actively support those of us on the left obviously the pro-Israel left, who are doing this challenging work. It would make an incalculable difference to those, for instance, in this new group in Toronto, to be perceived and supported as part of the international fight against anti-Semitism, rather than the response of, oh, you have ties and loyalties to certain causes on the left. Eh. Uh, we are facing now, as we all know, some very difficult times, and almost undoubtedly it's going to get worse before it gets better. We as an international community of scholars, Jewish community leaders and activists simply do not have the luxury of playing at internal Jewish politics with each other, right versus left. In fact, the truth that those of us in this room who are on the left and some who are not on the left, that we're in different places on the political spectrum is our power. It is our greatest resource because we can reach into all these other places that others can't. It means... In conclusion, it is my fervent hope that the love, I get emotional talking about love. <laughs> hate is easier, right? No one ever cries talking about hate. The love that we all feel for Israel and the Jewish people, for Am Yisrael, can overpower and outweigh like the love between Rachel and Leah, the disrespect and divisiveness that sometimes has occurred within our community so that we, along with our non-Jewish friends and allies, which thank God we do have, we can work together to defeat our enemies.
addicted to WBAI nonstop, said, we demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. And I knew I could have said, you know, I, I light candles for them, I pray for them, I weep for them, I stand with them. Instead, I said, you're asking me where I stand on the question of apartheid. I oppose it. And Islam is the largest practitioner of it anywhere in the world. And I began to list the features of gender and religious apartheid. And the place began to go crazy. The Jewish professor, in one sentence, became mocked, jeered, challenged. The hostility increased. Things began to become physical. And luckily, my son was there, and he was beginning to move towards the front of this large room. And finally, the organizers, finally, who ran a feminist bookstore, uh, hustled me out for my safety. And I called them between six and nine times to, to try to work it out within the feminist movement as feminists. And they were young feminists. And they didn't call me back because they were partying, apparently, because their conference was a great success. So I wrote it up reluctantly, and it went viral. And it may have been the first of many such instances, at least the first reported, of what happens on campus in America today when you tell the truth about Islam and or about Israel, because they kept saying, what about the humiliation at the checkpoints? What about the humiliation at the checkpoints? And I said, you know, war is difficult, conflict, etc. But I don't know, I don't think it's as bad as being killed by your brother and father because you want to go to college. You won't marry your first cousin. I said, they're not the same. It's not morally equivalent. What about the humiliation at the checkpoints? I said, not as bad as being, you know, forced to marry someone against your will, or etc. They didn't hear me. They didn't get it. They only knew what WBAI and the Academy had taught them. So that's one anecdote. Thank you all very, very much. I think we get moving to our break and then to the next session for their implications. It's a pleasure now to introduce the panel. Um, there is no greater authority to speak to this topic today than our first speaker, Professor Phyllis Chesler whose courageous and tireless outspokenness has shed light for so many around the world. A very abridged bio, very abridged, reads as follows. Phyllis Chesler is an emerita professor of psychology and women's studies at City University of New York. She is an author, psychotherapist, lecturer, and an expert courtroom witness. She has lectured and organized political, legal, religious, and human rights campaigns in the United States and Canada, Europe, the Middle East, and the Far East. Her work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Hebrew, Polish, and other European languages. Phyllis Chester is the co-founder of the still ongoing Association for Women in Psychology, and the National Women's Health Network, and is a charter member of the Women's Forum. She is a founder and board member of the International Committee for Women of the Wall, an affiliated professor with Haifa and Bar-Ilan Universities, and is also on the Siri Committee of the Human Rights Coalition Against Radical Islam. <coughs> In 1979 and 80, she worked at the United Nations and organized a meeting in Oslo. From there, she traveled to the World Conference in Copenhagen, which turned out to be a precursor to both Durban 1 and Durban 2. When faced with the bias and double standards which remained when it came to the Jewish movement of self-determination. When they found no room for their viewpoints within this, their ideological home, the situation forced a break. In some cases, it was an expulsion manifested in their marginalization and ostracism. In others, it was an abrupt leave-taking with no looking back. And in other cases, in different, different attempts to negotiate the divide. We're truly fortunate to have women of such distinction and prolific accomplishment address us today. We're determined to stick to the time limit allotted to each speaker so that 
there remains ample time for discussion. I would just say that cumulatively, these stories form an allegory, and as such, they are a gripping cautionary tale. Each speaker will note the corrosive effects of anti-Israel and anti-Zionist, anti-Israel and anti-Semitic attitudes on the feminist agenda and on the cause of women as well as Jews. Each one of them, in a different field, continues to argue for intellectual and moral honesty with respect to these issues. They will also note the heavy cost which resulted from taking a stand against the distortion of ideals to which they had been so fully committed. With today's accusations of dual loyalty being leveled at Jews and in America and elsewhere from some quarters, we do well to listen to their words and consider and they relocate and sit down. I want to begin with the good news, I was what is that sound? <laughs> Um, what are these challenges going on? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Echo, echo. Our technological expert from the 22nd century, Ron Simpson. I want to begin with some good news first. The panel, myself included, remain. We are the feminists. And the value now for all of us gathered here resides in the break that I've been making and that others will be able to make with Muslim feminists, Muslim dissidents, ex-Muslim feminists and dissidents who have felt utterly abandoned in their war against gender apartheid under Islam by Western left-oriented feminists, so that most of my work has recently been done with Muslim and ex-Muslim feminists and dissidents, and not with all the second wavers who probably are not reading or are reading. Uh, our topic is women and anti-Semitism. This is a reference not to those who have experienced anti-Semitic bigotry. It refers to the, to the experiencing of anti-Semitism as a woman, targeted ironically by other women, and from within a context where it would be least expected, at least on the face of it, namely from within the women's movement itself. This plenary, as we reach the conference conclusion, a conference that has been disturbing on so many levels, and yet I think um, has also been affirming on other levels for many of us. This plenary discusses a form of anti-Semitism that cuts across all of the perspectives we have heard. Its particularity derives from its very universality. If we consider the tremendous impact of feminist ideology on the world in which we live, if we attempt to grasp its incalculable influence, on our collective outlook and on virtually every aspect of contemporary human interaction, one can then grasp the potential reach of the values and perspectives it spreads. Our speakers bring very different stories, but share important features. Each has been a fully committed and identified activist within the feminist movement, fighting for its stated aims of equality and self-determination by fighting bias, bigotry, and double standards. Yet each experienced crushing disillusionment. Subsequently, she returned to America and convened a panel for the National Women's Studies Association, not far from here, Stores, Connecticut, right? uh, to confront about anti-Semitism in the name of feminism. Phyllis Chesler's 13 books and thousands of articles and speeches cover diverse issues. Her books include the classic Women and Madness, a new edition of which was published in 2005, a new edition of another classic, Women's in Humanity to Women, appeared in 2009, and her other books include The New Anti-Semitism, The Current Crisis, and What We Must Do About It, and The Death of Feminism, What's Next in the Struggle for Women's Freedom. She has published two important academic studies about honor killings, which appeared in the Middle East Quarterly in 2009 and in 2010. She has lived in Kabul, Afghanistan, in Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv, and now resides in Manhattan. 
with her current with her current with our current events, vindicating her prognoses of decades past. We are privileged that she will share her assessment and forecast with us today. Yes. The volume, whoever can adjust the volume, please come and do so. Now, I may not be able to, good morning, I may not be able to keep standing, so at a certain point, 